Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander from the Dinah Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is podcast episode 125, week 11 of the Drums of Autumn Read Along. Hello, hello, hello. It's been an interesting week. It looks like there are going to be standalone Outlander conventions, which is super exciting. It's from a company called Creation Entertainment. I will put the link in the podcast post, but it looks like it's a joint venture between Sony and Creation Entertainment, so it's an official sort of convention. And there's going to be one in Las Vegas in July. So I wonder if this means that Outlander will not be going to the San Diego Comic-Con. I have no idea. I'm simply questioning it because of the dates. And there's also going to be one in New Jersey in August. So they're a little pricey, but not any pricier than going to any other kind of convention from what I can tell. And there's some really good opportunities for photo ops for panels, that kind of thing. And it's all Outlander the whole weekend. So it's pretty exciting. I'm looking at the one in New Jersey and trying to see if I can swing it. I'm not sure if I can at this point, but I happen to be off call when it happens. So I hope you've had a fantastic week. And this podcast does not have as many links or kind of factoids about it like the other weeks. And it's really about relationship foundation and a foundation for pursuit of the future for Claire and Jamie. And the summary goes something like this. Roger attends mass with Brianna and survives. He proposes marriage. She turns him down. They argue. She explains herself. He'll wait for her. They declare love for the other. Claire, Jamie, and young Ian are living in the mountains. Jamie is taking the offer. They build small outbuildings. Provisions arrive. Duncan becomes Jamie's agent. They receive a blessing from Jocasta. They in turn bless their hearth. Duncan leaves to procure settlers. The white pig is a jerk. <laughs> that sums it up without any real detail. <laughs> Inside the chapters. Chapter 18, Unseemly Lust. After being raised by Reverend Wakefield in the Presbyterian Church, Roger is trepidatious of going to the Christmas Eve Catholic Mass with Brianna. Brianna dons a small circle mantilla in lieu of a full-size mantilla or chapel veil after they enter the church. She tells Roger it follows the tradition of women not being objects of unseemly lust while in church. St. Paul, probably, she said, whipping a comb from her purse to tidy the ends of her hair. He thought women ought to keep their hair covered all the time so as not to be objects of some seemly lust. Cranky old crab. Mama always said he was afraid of women. Thought they were dangerous. They are. <laughs> yes, Roger believes women are dangerous. <laughs> if you click on the link about the veils, there's an FAQ that explains it more fully. Women have been veiled in church going back to the whole early history of the Christian church. It sort of lost favor along the way, but it's making a comeback. And the site that I chose is a longtime friend of mine who renewed her faith um, and began attending Catholic church again regularly several years ago, and she started a veil business, and it has grown, and it's very successful, and her veils are beautiful. So click on it, give Lily some love. 
Brianna kisses Roger to the surprise of two parishioners. In Kirk? And on Christmas Eve, too. Well, let's know the Kirk exactly, Annie. It's only the vestibule, aye? And him the minister's lad and all. Well, you ken the saying, Annie. As the cobbler bairns go barefoot, I dare say it's the same with a preacher's lad that's gone to the dill. Come along in now. <laughs> that's gone to the devil. <laughs> yes. Brianna kissing Roger on the way into church. Tisk tisk, Brianna. Two women Roger has known his whole life are surprised to see him attending a Catholic service. To them, his intentions are apparent to set foot in such a place. He introduces Brianna to the elderly ladies. She seems unaware of the importance of his attending Mass with her. Maybe. Brianna crosses herself after dipping her fingers in holy water. This prompts Roger to remember a hill-walking day with the Reverend. Years ago, hill-walking with the Reverend, they had come upon a saint's pool hidden in a grove. There was a flat stone standing on end beside the tiny spring. The remnants of carving on it wore nearly to smoothness, no more than the shadow of a human figure. A sense of mystery hung about the small dark pool. He and the Reverend had stood there for some time, not speaking. Then the reverend had bent, scooped up a handful of water, and poured it out at the foot of the stone in silent ceremony, scooped up another and splashed it over his face. Only then had they knelt by the spring to drink the cold, sweet water. Above the reverend's bowed back, Roger had seen the tattered knots of fabric tied to tree branches above the spring, pledges, reminders of prayer, left by whoever still visited the ancient shrine. For how many thousands of years had men thus blessed themselves with water before seeking their heart's desire. Roger dabbed his fingers in the water and awkwardly touched both head and heart with something that might have been a prayer. That's beautiful. I think one of the missing pieces when the Reformation happened, when the church split and became Catholic and Protestant, was the reverence and the tradition and symbolism surrounding the things that we do before prayer and other sorts of religious remembrances or actions. And I love seeing it here. And I love seeing Roger struggle with it as well because Scottish Presbyterians are about as stalwart and plain as one can find. <laughs> Absolutely. Like anything Outside of what here, very plain practice, is considered voodoo and wrong and popish. Those sort of things. The reverence and the beauty and the use of water to bless or to prepare for prayer is ever apparent. Roger finds himself unsettled during parts of the service before it moves into a service he is familiar with. The things like the incense and the dress of the altar boys and the priest and things that seem mystical to Roger. He's enthralled by Brianna's hair. It shone in the dim light of the transept, thick and soft against the dark violet of her jumper. A jumper is like a hoodie or a sweater, jack light jacket. Its copper sparks muted by the dimness. It was the deep, rufous color of a red deer's pelt, and it gave him the same sense of helpless yearning he had felt when he surprised by a deer on a highland path. The strong urge to touch it, stroke the wild thing, and keep it somehow with him, coupled with the sure knowledge that a finger's move would send it flying. Ah, she's like a wild deer. As much as he knows her, she's still something of mystery. She's still something untamed to him. Just the use of nature is so beautiful in Diana's writing. I can't think of another word. It gives fullness and texture and 
the imagery and symbolism surrounding it gives us depth and understanding. It always brings us back. As images of Brianna's bare skin and snake-like hair in the hallway of the manse return to mind, he thinks that St. Paul may have been on to something in respect to women's hair and unseemly lust. <laughs> he focuses on the priest giving communion. Brianna goes to partake in communion, and Roger realizes he's praying in a wordless way of the heart. He yearns to be worthy of her, to love her right, and to care for her. He goes on to describe her face. It's strong and changeable. Brianna sang We Three Kings as they walked home. They lightly talk about religion, and she hopes she hasn't damned him for taking him to Mass. And for those of you who are not Protestant or Catholic, it is a big deal for them to cross over. A very big deal. And so for somebody who's Catholic to attend a Protestant service is suspect. And for a Protestant to go and attend a Mass is suspect. And it raises all kinds of challenges when you look at theology and belief and though it's the same God, there's so many things that are patently different. I think one must remember all the things that are patently the same so as to not throw stones. Hmm? The fog thickens as they walk along the river Ness or Loch Ness. Roger is feeling vulnerable without the comfort of church, knows it's time to ask her. Looking at her wide eyes, he senses secrets lurking. She reminds him of a Kelpie. Her eyes were wide and dark as a loch, with secrets moving, half seen, half sensed under rippling water. A Kelpie for sure. Each urage, a water horse mane, flowing, skin glowing, and the man who touches such a creature is lost, bound to it forever, taken down and drowned in the loch that gives it home. He felt suddenly afraid, not for himself, but for her, as though something might materialize from that water world to snatch her back away from him. He grasped her by the hand, as if to prevent her. Her fingers were cold and damp, a shock against the warmth of his palm. He takes the plunge and asks her to marry him. She doesn't respond the way he expects. He tries to play it off, that it's nothing. Saying his name, he turns to her with difficulty, not wanting to hear platitudes. She grabs his face and kisses him hard. This reminds me of how Jamie kisses Claire sometimes. In possession? But Brianna means something different. He pushes her away, confused. What in God's name are you playing at? I'm not playing. You said you wanted me, she gulped air. I want you too. Don't you know that? Didn't I say so in the hall this afternoon? I thought you did. What in the hell do you mean? I mean, I mean, I want to go to bed with you, she blurted. But you don't want to marry me. She shook her head, white as a sheet. Something between sickness and fury stirred in his gut and then erupted. So you'll not marry me, but you'll fuck me. How can you say such a thing? Don't use that sort of language to me. Language? You can suggest such a thing, but I must not say the word. I have never been so offended. Never! <laughs> he is much more like Jamie Fraser than a lot of people admit to. <laughs> He's a traditionalist in some ways in the modern world. And he was raised by a pastor. He's angry at her suggesting he just wants to bet her. He's angry at her suggesting she just wants to bet him. He yells at her. He could have had her any time during the summer. She slaps him. They have a row reminiscent of Claire and Jamie. Roger grabs her, kisses her hard and long while she fights him. Yeah, this seems really familiar right here. He could have had his way with her had he wanted. But I didn't. 
That wasn't what I wanted. It's not what I want now. But if you don't care enough to marry me, then I don't care enough to have you in my bed. <laughs> I do care, like hell. I care too damn much to marry you, you bastard. You what? Yeah, she sounds like her mother, too. <laughs> She's got the Fraser fire, but she was definitely raised by her mom. So poor Roger. <laughs> She's confused and frustrated him to no end. Because when I marry you, when I marry anybody, it's going to last. Do you hear me? If I make a vow like that, I'll keep it, no matter what it costs me. Your Scottish accent comes out when you get upset, she said with a feeble attempt at a smile as she handed back the wadded hanky. I shouldn't wonder. Now tell me what you mean and do it plainly before you drive me all the way to the Gaelic. You can speak Gaelic? I can. And if you don't want to learn a good many coarse expressions, write swiftly, talk. What do you mean by making me such an offer? And you a nice Catholic girl? Straight out of mass. I thought you were a virgin. I cannot understand why people think Roger is boring. He's every bit as strong, protective, smart, devoted, and loving as Jamie. He's simply modern. Then they get into the territory of her being a virgin and him not being one. He didn't want to marry the women he's bedded nor love them. He loves Brianna and wants to marry her. She thinks she loves him too. Think? Hmm. Her concern is Claire loving Frank, then falling in love with Jamie and breaking her promises and vows. And this is something Brianna wants to avoid. She meant it when she married him. I could see it in those pictures you gave me. She said better or worse, rich or poor, and she meant it. And then, and then she met Jamie Fraser, and she didn't mean it anymore. I, I don't blame her, not really, not after I thought about it. She couldn't help it. And I, when she talked about him, I could see how much she loved him. But don't you see, Roger? She loved my father, too. Then something happened. She didn't expect it, and it wasn't her fault. But it made her break her word. I won't do that, not for anything. Knowing it's more than a year they can be together, she worries she can meet someone else, or he could. He wants to know if she loves him. She responds by opening his coat and putting her arms around him tightly. As Roger and Brianna kiss, the two women from Mass comment and walk by. Roger tries to let go of Brianna, but he cannot. He stood for a minute, willing himself to let go of her. But once a man has touched the mane of a water horse, it's no simple matter to let go. An old Kelpie rhyme ran through his head. And sit wheel, Jeanette. And ride wheel, Davy, and your first stop will be the bottom of Loch Cavey. I'll wait, he said, and let her go. He held her hands and looked into her eyes, now soft and clear as rain pools. Hear me, though, he said softly. I will have you all, or not at all. Hmm. He wants her body, mind, and spirit. He gives her the present that he bought. An engraved silver bracelet. And it says, Je t'aime un peu, beaucoup, passionnément, pas de tout. I love you, a little, a lot, passionately, not at all. And she says, je t'aime. Wow, that was a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> it veered in a direction that Roger had not expected. They needed to hammer it out to get on the same page. Brianna is being wise and not saying yes at this point. Her mother did break her vows to Frank, even though she didn't mean to. She did fall in love with someone else. Roger will wait the year out. 
they're still working on communication and expectation in their relationship. I wonder if being only children makes it more difficult to speak up and to be clear and plain. It seems to take them a long time to get around to things. There's still that nervousness, even though they share intimacies that nobody else could share with them that they know of on the planet Earth. (laughs) But if they spoke more plainly, they would avoid so many problems, I think. Roger is a good man. He's a bit older than her. Not quite as much older as Frank was to Claire when they got married. And they're a good match. I think he is quite a bit like both of her fathers combined. He's a historian, an intellect, an academic. But yet he has the heart of a Highlander. He has that passion, that tradition, the desire to protect and fight for what he believes in. So he's not stuck in the past and looking backwards into history quite as much as I think Frank probably was. Chapter 19, Part 7, On the Mountain, Hearth Blessing, July 1767. Claire compares sleeping under the stars with a lover to sharing a cramped lean-to with a wet husband, a wet nephew, and a large wet dog. (laughs) One is a bit more romantic than the other. (laughs) Pungent male odor overpowers, and Claire needs air. She makes her way into the coldness. The rain stopped, but it was high humidity with everything covered in water. She's going to the creek to wash and fill the kettle. She describes the pre-dawn morning. Barefooted and cold-toed, I made my way carefully down to the stream to wash, kettle under arm. It wasn't yet dawn, and the forest was filled with mist and gray-blue light. Crepuscle, the mysterious half-light that comes at both ends of the day, when the small secret things come out to feed. It sounds like one of the two magical times of day, the other being twilight. It does. It seems like others, other things, magical things, mysterious things can exist in those two spaces. It's sort of like the space when you're just about to fall asleep, but you're not quite asleep. That's what it reminds me of. At Jamie's suggestion, they stayed on the mountain to take advantage of the decent weather. It would be snowing soon, and the two months would be enough time to get a small cabin built and dry meat that they hunted. Claire is scared. She thought they'd return to Cross Creek for winter and come back in spring. They are far away from other settlers. It's a dangerous prospect considering the lack of tools and supplies. Claire misses the safety and security River Run offers. Hot water, food, shelter. Jamie getting out from under Jocasta's hospitality and thumb is necessary to keep out of her Machiavellian web. Claire likens her to a blind spider. Diana Gabaldon uses this theme of spiders weaving in webs throughout the series. The choices we make, the paths we take, who we get caught up with. Are we getting roped into somebody's web, whether it's deceit or good. It's a great visual throughout the books. Yes, but Jocasta being a Mackenzie, she's definitely a blind spider. She is always working it. She's always looking for advantages, always trying to meet her end goals. Like she will do whatever she needs to do. And if he stayed near her, it would be very difficult for him not to be in her grasp. Given all of the reasons Claire can think of, she believes none of them are the reason Jamie chose to stay. He needs the land to need him, a place to build and shape. He needs the burden and responsibility. He needs to lead something. He needs to have a mountain. Claire trusts him with her heart and life. Myers went back to Cross Creek to give instructions to Duncan, assure Joe Costa all is well, and gather all the stores the rest of their money would buy. 
He'd return before the first snow if he could. Otherwise, he will come back in the spring with the supplies. Young Ian is staying with Claire and Jamie. He's needed to help build the shelter and with any other work. For now, they were managing on what Claire could gather. She splashes her face and swishes her mouth with the creek water. When I looked up, face dripping, I saw two deer drinking from a pool on the other side, a little way upstream from me. I stayed very still, not to disturb them, but they showed no alarm at my presence. In the shadow of the birches, they were the same soft blue as the rocks and trees, little more than shadows themselves, but each line of their bodies etched in perfect delicacy, like a Japanese painting done in ink. Then all of a sudden they were gone. I blinked and blinked again. I hadn't seen them turn or run, and in spite of their ethereal beauty, I was sure I hadn't been imagining them. I could see the dark imprints of their hooves in the mud of the far bank, but they were gone. I didn't see or hear a thing, but the hair rose suddenly on my body, instant rippling up arms and neck-like electric current. I froze. It was no more than six feet away from me, half visible behind a bush. The sound of its lapping was lost in the noise of the stream. Then the broad head lifted and a tufted ear swiveled toward me. Though I made no noise, could it hear me breathing? Hmm. Well, it was a big cat that she sees. It gazes in her eyes after drinking its fill, but leaves her alone after it cleans its ears. It really is something that lions and tigers and jaguars and bobcats name your large non-house cat. And they do a lot of the same behaviors that our little kitty cats do. Well, our little kitty cats really are not domesticated. They choose to live with us, but <laughs> it's only because they choose to. They're just as dangerous they're just smaller, so we can pick them up. <laughs> the cat is at least six feet long. After it left, Claire is terrified. And this is where she has her sort of letdown response, as she normally does after an emergency or some other high adrenaline situation. She, sa she shakes and can barely... Fill the kettle. She trusts Jamie and this time stayed alive. My hand shook so that I dropped the kettle three times in filling it. Trust him, he said. Did I trust him? Yes, I did. And a fat lot of good that would do unless he happened to be standing directly in front of me next time. But for this time, I was alive. I stood still, eyes closed, breathing in the pure morning air. I could feel every single atom of my body, blood racing to carry round the sweet, fresh stuff to every cell and muscle fiber. The sun touched my face and warmed the cold skin to a lovely glow. I opened my eyes to a dazzle of green and yellow and blue. Day had broken. All the birds were singing now. I went up the path toward the clearing, resisting the impulse to look behind me. <laughs> I'd say that'd be a bit of a fright. They are settling in the unspoiled wilds of North Carolina. I mean, just in my neighborhood this week, there was a bobcat down at the bottom of my street because we have all these green areas that are connected into the residential areas, which is fabulous because we have such great outdoor opportunities where I live. But that also means we see deer and bear and big cats sometimes. That's part of living here. And so when I hike, I'm very careful. I've not come upon one yet, only a few minor snakes, but you never know. When Claire returns, Jamie was pacing out a shed and young Ian had started a fire. The shed is going to be for curing and smoking meats like the Indians do. Now, I'm going to stop for just a second, and I was having a conversation this morning with somebody who has 
tribal background, heritage, and there's not a foregone conclusion what indigenous peoples want to be called, whether it's natives, Native American, American Indian, Indian, it varies and all the words are used. I can't really find online what the Tuscarora or Mohawk currently use, but it could vary person to person or area of where a tribe is now settled. So I'm trying to be sensitive to that and it's awkward. But until I get more information or one of you calls or emails me with updated terminology that I haven't been able to find yet, I will use what the book uses. The second shed is for Claire's herbs and plants. The first shed is built in two days, though the roof is crude. They don't have a proper roof on it yet. It's simply branches. It was fit for sleeping the three of them and Rolo. That night, as they lie together, Jamie critiques his workmanship. <laughs> Claire tends to his splintered hands while he talks. You've never built a shed out of logs before, have you? Ow, no, but, and you built the bloody thing in two days with nothing but a felling axe and a knife, for God's sakes. There's not a nail in it. Why ought you expect it to look like Buckingham Palace? I've never seen Buckingham Palace, he said rather mildly. He paused. I do take your point, though, Sassanok. He's very critical of his work, and he thinks nothing is straight. It's all wrong. Guy has virtually no tools, and he built them a suitable shelter. <laughs> he turns his attention to telling her his plans for a big house on the hill where the strawberries grow. It will have a surgery for Claire and a library for Jamie. He only owns one book at present, but I'm sure he'll fill it up. And the book he owns is The Natural History of North Carolina. It will be a grand house. Myers returned within the month, bringing three pack mules with many necessary items and Duncan Innes. They now had two sheds and a pen built for animals they might acquire. Currently, they only have a small white piglet as their total stock of animals. She slept in the shed with them because she's too little for the pen. Jamie shows Duncan the layout of the land and tells his plans. Jocasta sent a feather bed along with pens and paper. Claire is thrilled. Young Ian and Myers return from successful hunting squirrel and a wild turkey. They will eat well over the next several days. This shows how fertile the land and offerings are. Even though it's dangerous and wild and tricky, there's so much to offer. And if they're able to hunt properly and plan well, they're going to do very well in this area. Jamie needs to write the governor to accept the offer and give the details of the land he chose. They eat a nice meal. But Claire hopes Myers will stay to help fill their meat shed so they don't need to eat dried fish all winter. After dinner, Jamie wants to talk with Duncan so he can choose his plot of land in exchange for acting as Jamie's agent. Duncan is stunned. He's been penniless since Culloden. Every emotion runs through him, and he accepts. He's to oversee finding settlers, particularly to find those transported from Ardsmuir. The second job is to help his Aunt Jocasta run her plantation. He's hesitant, but Jamie explains that Jocasta knows the business end. She simply needs a man to speak for her. Young Ian is going through the packs Myers brought, and Jocasta sent a piece of iron to bless the hearth with. Jamie is moved by the gift. It's rooted in pagan tradition. It's a blessing for protection and prosperity to put iron on the entry door, in this case under the hearth. It is also Jocasta saying she blesses and accepts the new venture while forgiving Jamie for not returning. Two days later, they bless the hearth. 
Myers had removed his hat from respect, and Ian had washed his face. Rollo was present, too, as was the small white pig, who was required to attend as the personification of our flocks. <laughs> Despite her objections, the pig saw no point in being removed from her meal of acorns to participate in a ritual so notably lacking in food. This is really what the pig is like her whole life. <laughs> Ignoring piercing pig screams of annoyance, Jamie held a small iron knife upright by its tip so that it formed a cross and said quietly, God bless the world and all that is therein. God bless my spouse and my children. God bless the eye that is in my head and bless God the handling of my hand. What time I rise in the early, what time I lie down late in bed, bless my rising in the morning early and my lying down late in bed. He reached out and touched first me, then Ian, and with a grin, Rollo and the pig with the iron before going on. God protect the house and the household. God con consecrate the children of the motherhood. God encompass the flocks and the young. Be thou after them and tending them. What time the flocks ascend hill and wold. What time I lie down to sleep. What time the flocks ascend hill and wold. What time I lie down in peace to sleep. Let the fire of thy blessing burn forever upon us, O God. He knelt down by the hearth and placed the iron into the small hole dug for it, covered it over, and tamped the dirt flat. Then he and I took the ends of the big hearthstone and laid it carefully into place. I think that's such beautiful ritual. It makes me all warm and fuzzy. <laughs> Outside the cabin, Duncan offers a blessing of his own. Duncan held this in his one hand and walked sunwise around the cabin's foundation, chanting in loud Gaelic. Jamie translated to me as he sang, The safeguard of Fionn Mac, Caval be yours. The safeguard of Cormac, the shapely, be yours. The safeguard of Con and Conval be yours. From wolf and from bird flock, from wolf and from bird flock. He paused in his chanting as he came to each point at the compass, and bowing to the four erts, swept his brand in a blazing arc before him. Rollo, plainly disapproving of these pyromaniac goings-on, growled deep in his throat, but was firmly shushed by Ian. The shield of the king of Fionn be yours, the shield of the king of the sun be yours, the shield of the king of the stars be yours, in jeopardy and distress, in jeopardy and distress. There were a good many verses. Duncan circled the house three times. It was only as he reached the final point, next to the freshly laid hearthstone, that I realized Jamie had laid out the cabin so the hearth lay to the north. The morning sun fell warm on my left shoulder and threw our mingled shadows to the west. The sheltering of the King of Kings be yours. The sheltering of Jesus Christ be yours. The sheltering of the Spirit of Healing be yours. From evil deed and quarrel, from evil dog and red dog. With a look down his nose at Rollo, Duncan stopped by the hearth and gave the brand to Jamie, who stooped in turn and set alight the waiting pile of kindling. Ian gave a Gaelic whoop as the flame blazed up, and there was general applause. <laughs> this brings tears to my eyes to have Duncan offer something so beautiful in prayer to their home. He's a good man who has found family with McDew. He's not alone any longer. Myers and Duncan left to attend the large Scots gathering at Mount Helican. It's the largest in the colonies. Jocasta and Farquhar Campbell would be there. It's the best place to start searching for the transported Ardsmere men. Scots came from other colonies to attend. Jamie wrote Jocasta a letter, but gives a message to Duncan to pass on to her as well. Tell my aunt I shall not see her at the gathering this year, or perhaps the next. But the one after that, I shall be there without fail, and my people with me. Godspeed, Duncan. Claire feels a sense of loss with Duncan leaving. He feels like a link to civilization. They are not alone, though. Young Ian is still there with Rollo, the pig, three horses, and two mules. Claire feels better thinking of what they've done so far. And as soon as Claire is feeling encouraged... Young Ian tells her the pig ate all the nut meal. 
<laughs> that act could be a foreshadowing of hard times to come or simply the pig's devil may care attitude. You be the judge. <laughs> so Roger wants a solid foundation with Brianna and Brianna wants the same with Roger. She wants to know nothing's going to come between them. She wants to know her vows, her promises will be kept. And Claire is feeling the same way about this land. It's scary. It's unknown. But it has so much to offer. And Jamie needs this to feed his spirit. He's a man of the mountains. He needs to be the head of an estate, of a family. He needs to care for people. It's in his nature. And this is the foundation that's being set for their future. And now they already have the two sheds built. The small cabin will be built shortly. It's been heartily blessed by friend and family. And they're off to a good start. Though I say a very brave start to be such a pioneer. So what's coming up? The next podcast will feature chapters 20 and 21. And you can participate by sending your comments to contact at a drum of outlander.com or leave a message on the listener line at 719-425-9444. If you're reading ahead, you can simply leave comments for any part of the book that you want to. Please join the Wednesday night weekly Twitter chat at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern using the hashtag ADOO. This past week's chat was called short because my job as a midwife uh, was called to task, so I had to leave early. But generally, it's every week. Any comments or messages may be included in the podcast or the written post. As always, the Outlander book series is written by Diana Gabaldone, and you can find her on Twitter and Facebook. All the links to her are in this podcast post. And you can find A Dram of Outlander um, on Facebook, on the Dram of Outlander page. You can join the Dram of Outlander group, but you have to ask and answer three simple questions. So I know you're not a troll or a bot. You can find... A Dram of Outlander on Instagram and Twitter under Dram of Outlander with no A in the front. And you can support the podcast in a variety of ways. Joining the social media pages, following the website, interacting with other people in the Dram of Outlander community through social media. You can please share the podcast. Tell people about it. I do it for you. I do it for the listeners. And go into Apple Podcasts and please leave a review. That helps people find me also on Stitcher and Google Play and a variety of other streaming services where you can find the podcast. And if you'd like to financially support the podcast, every dollar counts. And you can go to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash a dram of Outlander. And every dollar is so appreciated. I do this all by myself from the research to the producing and for keeping up on the website and all the other places and things that I need to do a podcast. I do have an email from Meredith of Everett, Washington. She is faithful every, almost every week to get one in. Dear Desiree, about the proposal at Christmas time, I do believe that Brianna was right not to say yes to Roger. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. That expression doesn't have much evidence to support it. Long distance relationships have done more for a wandering eye than a fonder heart. <laughs> Brianna is right that they can't promise they'll stay together while living countries apart. They're both on college campuses, which are the biggest dating pools in existence. In fact, Roger being most definitely the youngest professor at Oxford probably has a number of students who have a crush on him. I know that practically everyone considers Claire and Jamie a success story, but in some ways it's a cautionary tale. Poor Frank had to live with the notion that his wife had been kidnapped and or killed for almost three years. And when he finally got her back, 
and had to hear that his wife fell in love with another man. I doubt Claire would have made that same choice had she known for certain that time went forth in the 20th century without her. Almost all time travel stories allow the traveler to go back to the exact moment they left. Outlander broke that formula. Brown and Roger are both learning that being away from a loved one has a definite price. Brianna was close to Frank, so of course her sympathies are with him, and Roger may not remember him clearly, but he knows that he followed in Frank's footsteps. He became a historian, teaches at Oxford, just as Frank did. Roger also fell in love with the strong woman, who may or may not need him. So Brianna is right to say that they need to wait until she's done with school, and until they know each other better. I'm relieved that Diana Gabaldon does explore the themes of sacrifice and unrequited love so effectively in her books. Sincerely, Meredith. I think this is sums it up in a great way, Meredith, and thank you for your commentary. I do think because Brianna is so determined to keep her vows that she has to be absolutely 100% certain that she and Roger are going to make it. I mean, we can't always be certain of that, of course, but we can have a good foundation for a relationship before moving forward. And he loves her enough to wait and not push her now because it would be wrong to. She'd be like a trapped cat, which is never a good thing. And part of it, I think, was Brianna getting to that understanding that her mom and dad... Claire and Frank didn't have a passionate, loving relationship. They had a good working relationship. So Brianna never noticed that they weren't super in love. And until she was much older, did she start seeing the cracks? And then when she found out about Jamie Fraser, it completely blew the illusion they did such a good job co-parenting that it completely knocked her off balance and made her think, my mother has such character. My mother is such a good woman. And look what she did. Now, Brianna has no idea what her dad, Frank, may have been doing all those years. And if he could have been stepping out on Claire after she returned and after Brianna was born, we haven't even dabbled in that. And Brianna doesn't know anything or even thinks anything about that. So in her mind, like her dad was just incredibly hurt and had a wife who broke her vows unintentionally or not. She did. And that is a big deal. And it's very mature of her to see that because Brianna is vastly different from the 18 year old who f found out about Jamie Fraser to who she is now. She's grown up a lot in the couple of years that it's been. Yeah. Incredible. I don't know. Would you have such faith in someone as Claire has in Jamie, like to be dragged up to the mountains where there's literally nothing and nobody. This is you against nature. That's a pretty strong theme here. Usually nature is Claire and Jamie's friends, but nature can turn around and bite you in the ass <laughs> and kill you. So that is a strong element here. Individual versus nature. Hmm. We'll see. And let me know if you'd like me to include a little bit more analysis in the read along. If you want me to really point out at the end of the podcast, you know, the different sort of devices that are being used in the chapters we covered. I mean, I can do that. I do sometimes, but not always. I think that Roger and Brianna getting to the point that they're at is actually strengthening them, but they're an entire ocean apart 
in a time where they didn't have the internet, like they didn't have FaceTime or Skype. Telephone calls were really expensive, so they had to rely on the written letter or seeing each other a couple times a year, and I can't imagine how difficult that was. Now it is not enough to sustain a relationship. And I think partly because not only would your significant other be vying for your attention in these different technological ways, if you have a long distance relationship, other people could be vying for the attention in real life and on social media. So where something is helpful on one side, it could be a devastation on the other. Everything has its positives and negatives. So we'll see what happens for Roger and Brianna. We know that they're in the zone for going forward. And I can't wait to see life on the ridge unfold. It just sounds so beautiful. And with my friend Gina being from there, I want to get more information from her because her family settled in this very area. And her, there's family history that is amazing that she shares with me all the time. So I think I would like to have her on. And we've discussed it before, so it's okay for me to bring it up uh, to answer some questions about the region and what it was like when she was young and how they lived. So thank you so much for listening and walking through these characters with me. I just love them so much. And I appreciate you for coming on this journey with me week after week. <laughs> so until next time, Slangeva.